I was just sitting here making a couple arrowheads. Stone napping is one of the most important skills you can learn in wilderness survival. But if all you can do is make simple arrowheads or simple spearheads, uh, that's really not uh, uh, all there is to stone working. Why just do the simplest work and you can aspire to become a master? Like the uh, like the spearhead set right here. See, there's a buffalo glass knife right there, and it's got a sharp mouth. And this tool here, not only is it elegant, but it's also very functional because I use this for, for rope making. To cut, uh, I use a little sharp mouth right there to cut rope fibers. And because I made this elegant base right here, I can also use it as a holder for my, my most prized spearheads. This obsidian right here has the most stunning uh, colorations that you can find pretty much anywhere. Yeah. It's almost audacious to just make a simple arrowhead out of it, or a simple spearhead, depending on the size of your piece of stone. There's only so many of these. And why, why, why should I make this plane? Why can't I turn that into something absolutely stunning like a, an animal? And what a wonderful way to cherish wildlife and cherish nature and these valuable uh, uh, stones that we have. Now, I don't want to squander this ruby on something just general or plain. I want to make something stunning and beautiful out of it. Something I can cherish. And if it's a tool that I can use, and I'd say it's that much more better. But before I can make something awesome like this, I have to understand how, how to be able to do that. Now this ruby jawbone knife right here was roughly shaped and then shattered out of the heart of the stone. It was cracked. Every one of these facets you see here is a break meridian where the stone was shattered. And in the same respect, this buffalo profile glass right here was chipped and snapped with the pressure flaking method. So those are the two methods we're going to discuss. Shattering stones to get what you want versus pressure flaking to get what you want. And the most clever method was where uh, the stone would be shaped, thrown into a rock tumbler, and tumbled until it was smooth, then it would be heated in a fire, and then cracked when hot. And that's, that's how you can get the, the larger, uh, more exciting stones like some of the spear points, and the larger jawboard and knives and stuff like that. Uh, they have to be shaped, tumbled, heated, and then cracked. If we look at the book I wrote, you can plainly see, First, the stone is shaped. It kind of looks like a boot. See, it's got a heel and a drop toe portion. And the bottom side, you see, it's got a projection off to one side and it's flatter on the other. And when the stone was heated, you heat the stone, put an anvil rock behind it, and you crack it from one end to the other so that the shock waves travel straight through the stone. It would knock the cheeks off of it. It would knock this cheek off of it right here. Then it would leave this distinctive jawbone shape with a nice sharp edge right along there. And that's how this knife was made. It was shaped, tumbled in a tumbler, heated, and then cracked. And 
you may have heard some of the South American peoples uh, talking about cracking the faces in half. And what they would do is they would take stones that were shaped like faces and they would crack them right down the middle and they certainly would. Their, their face would crack right in half. And give you a sharp right-handed blade and a sharp left-handed blade. And one of the quickest methods of making a stone tumbler is just to take a little plastic or metal container like this one right here. You open the lid, put your stones in there, and, uh, and turn it by hand. Instead of plastic buckets, the Massachusetts Indians would use birch bark barrels to turn their stones in. Right here is a pictogram of an axe head. Uh, you can see that the center core is a compression streak or a very hard layer of stone. And on either side of it is a softer layer of stone. And these axes would have been shaped, tumbled in a tumbler, heated and then and then cracked and that's that center piece of stone right there would have been the actual axe head and here's a photo of that actual axe head uh, you can see the compression streak and this here is a bear's head that was made with that same process and a larger stone was shaped and it was tumbled in a rock tumbler and the stone was heated and then it was cracked in half you can see this side is completely flat and this side however is a bear's head any other method of shaping this stone would have, would have ruined the piece and then I have this stone knife here see drawn down to an edge you can see the shape of it. Well, this ruby right here is a similar piece, and it was broken, shaped, tumbled in a tumbler, and it's now ready to be cracked. See, see the similarity in the shape. And my friends, what they do with their, their coral to make arrowheads, spearheads, and stuff like that is they'll bake it in an oven at 350 degrees for 15 hours. And that tempers the stone and makes it more glassy, more brittle. And uh, you know, when you temper your stones like that, it gives you superior, uh, superior edges, superior cutting edges. And it also helps to strengthen the stone. So tempering your stones will bring you closer to getting a perfect scallop. And you can see the, the center of the scallop on this one is here. And you can see the arched, arched lines that run across it right there. And when you get a perfect scallop, uh, it'll look just like a clam shell or uh, you know shells or whatever. And those, those are the kind of stones you want to use to make your arrowheads. That was a, the secret to the Clovis point, was to start with a perfect scallop. And this stone right here uh, is a bark removal tool. It's for, it's for taking bark off of uh, linden trees or the basswood tree or other rope bark trees. And it looks just like a badger. If you look very closely, you can even see the lines that, uh, uh, the, the coloration lines of the badger, where it has a white stripe, white stripes with a black streak, and it, it perfectly resembles a badger. And this stone here is a foot. See, if you closely study it, you'll see every line of symmetry that a human foot has, this stone has also. And this stone was shaped, heated, and then cracked. cracked. And the core of the stone that this was cracked out of, the, the cheeks were tossed away, and the foot that came out of the center of it was desirable, and that's what was kept. And again, this oyster knife, if I can show you all the facets on it, 
See, nice and flat right there. That's the center of it. Shaped, tumbled, heated, and cracked. And this is the core that came out of the center of the stone. And this, this knife here was used for uh, shucking out clams and oysters and other shellfish like that. Now you can work a mildly soft stone with a very hard stone like these black diamonds right here. Yeah, diamond and quartz. And you would take these white stones, crush them down to um, sand or a dust even. And uh, you can use these to cut with. You know, sprinkle powder on the stone and cut with a piece of copper or whatever. Or you can put the dust in a tumbler, put your stones in with it, and tumble it. And these are uh, abrasive enough to, uh, to smooth or cut the stones. So to cut a soft stone, you need to use a harder stone. And as you can see, all stones are put together like that. Every one of them, even the, even the glassy flints black diamonds and rubies, all stones are constructed in the same manner. So the same method of working will uh, work with all stones. And I can use these, these compression streaks to my advantage. And I can shape this stone, I can smooth it, I can heat it in a fire, and then I can, I can crack it and my piece of work will pop right off where that gradient line is. So if I'm making a knife or some other sort of tool, um, when I shape it, I'll bear in mind where I want it to break at. And if you compare this stone to this stone, see the shape? See the shape? See the flat spot? See the compression streak? Let's discuss stone shaping tools for a minute. Then you take your pointed metal tool, whether it's iron, copper, whatever you're using, and you want to shape the stone, you press it into the stone and twist. You press and twist. And you press and twist. And what that does what that does is it, it crumbles the material away a little bit at a time. You see with the tomahawk you've got your grinding point and you got a pivot point. And what you do is you put your grinding point down on the stone and you take a pry bar and you press down on the pivot point and you would spin the tomahawk and you'd use that, that spinning action and the, the pressure to degrade the stone, to crumble away the stone and shape it where you wanted it. Uh, tomahawk was one of the most important of all the tools because you could uh, develop enough pressure to, uh, to crumble the stone away. And, you, know, you can even work flint with this tool. So even a simple thing like this little piece of rebar here can be used the same way. You press into the stone, press it and twist, press and twist, press and twist, and it'll crumble that material away and it'll allow you to shape the stone. So almost none of the stone working techniques involved uh, hammering and chiseling, although um, in those instances when you would need to do that, that would be apparent to you. And the tomahawk was one of the most important of all the, the press and twist tools for doing the stone working. Uh, I'm going to tumble these stones. I guess I'm out of time. Uh, my name is Jack Survival. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time.